uh, panel, which is a discussion group. Um, and um, so community health, community health is, I would say, the societal or the front face of aging. It's uh, a very holistic approach to the aging individual, and it takes into consideration many, many other factors. And chairing this panel today is Dr. Janet Townsend, and I'd like to just say a little bit about her and, um, uh, and why this is such a wonderful fit. Every panel head, will, you'll see, is a wonderful fit to take us through this morass or this jungle of the aging process. Uh, Dr. Townsend is the founding chair of the Department of Family and Community and Rural Health Medicine at the Commonwealth Medical College. She was awarded her MD from Harvard uh, Medical School and performed her residency in the family medicine, in family medicine at Somerset Medical Center, Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Jersey. After 25 years of educational leadership at Montefiore Medical Center and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, which was focused primarily on primary care physicians for practice in underserved areas and recruiting underrepresented individuals into healthcare careers, she joined the leadership at TCMC. And that's important. Her role is not just faculty, it's leadership. There she served as PI of a regional health assessment of 16 counties and a site PI of the Eager Study, a multi-center NIH trial of low-dose aspirin in pregnancy to prevent miscarriage. Her department uh, and TCMC, uh, M TCMC students work with community partners to improve health status in Northeast Pennsylvania. Dr. Townsend and several colleagues at TCMC are part of the HRSA funded geriatrics educational consortium led by Jefferson Medical College. So with that being said, I'd like to welcome Dr. Townsend. Thank you, Herb, very much. That's a big introduction for someone who's really just the facilitator. Um, I really want you to benefit from our four colleagues that will join us today. But I think this is such an extraordinary opportunity, and I love Mario's slide about our brains being full because it's really challenging us all. Uh, when Dr. Rusak talked about the vocabulary of an analytical chemist, I think all of us are stretching our brains with new vocabulary today as we look at the spectrum from basic science to community. So what we really want to do is really give some snapshots of some very, very um, innovative, caring, important work in the community, and then wrap up our time within this panel with some discussion with you about how can we best maximize participation and function of the elders in our community. As we talked about our panel, everybody used the framework, well, what my agency, what my organization does is we take care of people from cradle to grave. And in terms of the um, elders, we really think about people in the context of their families and communities. We're aware, when we started to plan this panel, there's so many people we could have invited to be on this panel. Many of you in the room um, could have been uh, presenters in this panel. I think of the, the State Office on Aging, we had the pleasure of meeting with Secretary Duke and Mr. Snedden yesterday about their work, the Area Agency on Aging. Um, many faith communities who work in, so hard to take care of elders. And I, I'm looking at my friend Don Knoll, who served on the advisory board for our regional health assessment. Um, the community activists and community volunteers that were talked about as we met with focus groups throughout Northeast PA are all really important parts of the network of care for elders. But what I'd like to do is, what I'm going to do is introduce um, each person briefly um, before they speak. Uh, in fact, actually, I think in the interest of time, I will introduce each of our presenters and then I'll let them go one after another. We're each are going to take about 10 minutes to tell the, you a little bit about their work and some of the things we should be thinking about. And then that should leave us about 15 minutes at the end um, for some robust discussion together. So on my immediate left, I have Eric Pusey. Eric is a community pharmacist at the Medicap Pharmacy in Oliphant. He's also the president-elect of the Lackawanna County a pharmacy association and a certified diabetes educator. He will present to you some really truly community and family-based solutions um, 
to helping elders take manage their medications. And when we talked about uh, pharmacy, we were thinking about the pharmacist as really one of the most accessible healthcare professionals that we have. Uh, in fact, you were making me think, Eric, as we talked about that, as our, my family pharmacist as I grew up, Stan, I, I can't remember his last name in New Jersey, but he was truly a source of care for my family. Um, and he's also doing some very innovative work collaborating with Herb and when bringing together kind of high-tech and high-touch strategies for caring for people. Um, my colleague Maggie Bushwick, who is a social worker, I got to meet when I was asked to join the board of Jewish Family Service. She's the coordinator of older services there. And she, it, Jewish Family Service, as you may know, is a non-sectarian uh, agency that in the Jewish tradition provides care um, to many members of our community and in particular makes a commitment to the elders in our community. Um, her work really spans work with the most vulnerable elders all the way to health promotion and prevention activities with healthy uh, aging persons such as myself um, and is able to work both to solve problems but also to bring meaning and connection to the elders. Next to Maggie is Dr. Hayat Abubi, who is from the University of Scranton. He's the Interim Associate Dean here at Penusca College. And as you know, the college includes numerous health professions um, who work together uh, to afford care to the community. By training, he's a biomedical engineer, but has very broad interests and accomplishments. And in fact, um, some of his most groundbreaking work was work on screening and treatment of osteoporosis in the region, one of the first people to do that. And then finally, after our three colleagues present about their work, we invited Peg Kopko from the United Way, who can provide a very broad perspective on services in the area, um, and in particular services for aging. And we've asked Peg to respond um, to our panelists' presentations. Peg is the Vice President of Community Impact at the United Way. Um, and when you think about the United Way, many of our organizations participate, and many of us as individuals participate in community campaigns to donate money so that the United Way can bring together people, coordinate services, set priority, and help support them with the funds that are necessary. Um, it, when you think of the United Way, it's really a paragon of, of commitment to, to community and our abilities to be a village together, to take care of not just our raising children, but to taking care of our elders. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from my colleagues, and I'm going to ask Eric Pusey to come up as the first speaker. Welcome everyone, and again, my name is Eric Pusey. I'm a pharmacist. I'm also a diabetes educator by trade. But what I want to talk to you about today is retail community pharmacy. And, oh, excuse me? Thank you. I'm short, so. <laughs> retail community pharmacy, what we do is we are, the, as Dr. mentioned, we are the most accessible, one of the most accessible healthcare professionals of a, uh, in the area. And what we pride ourselves on is the ability and the ability to speak with individuals of all ages. We are concerned with people from birth through their eventual demise. But one of our focuses, at least at, in the independent community pharmacy mold, uh, model, is to look at how we can affect the outcomes of our individuals. As I mentioned, community pharmacy, we are accessible, we are convenient, I am going to do a commercial for pharmacy, so just so you know, that's part of what I'm doing here. But the most important thing is that our patients and our customers need to have the freedom of choice and need to have the ability to go where they need to get the services that they need. So what we want to do is we want to provide our patients and our customers with a lifestyle that will allow them to remain in their homes as long as possible. So one of the things that we do in community retail pharmacy is provide services that are going to be an asset to them and to their families. One of the pr uh, services that we provide, many of us do provide, of course are home delivery, e immediate access to the pharmacist so that patients or their caregivers can call us at any time and we do get calls throughout the evening and throughout the night and that's what we like because again we're able to interact directly with those patients. If a patient has a problem with their medications, with their compliance, we're there to help them. 
if patients have problems with their insurance, and that's a big issue now. Patients have so many options, so many choices, so many difficulties that they have to deal with. Pharmacists are right there to be able to deal with them, and that's what we need to do. Many of our pharmacies are specialized as I am in diabetes. We have diabetes incentive programs. We have diabetes counseling programs. We also have high blood pressure programs. We work with patients. We work with physicians. We try to have a collaborative effort to develop protocols and, and guidelines for our patients to follow. Many of the local pharmacies also do immunizations. And again, the importance of immunizations at a local level is it's convenient. It allows our patients to get the immunizations, whether it be shingles vaccine or flu vaccine. These are things that are now available right in your community at any time. Another part of pharmacy is being an advocate and being an advocate for the elderly. Because again, so many patients are on their own. They have family members, but our, we know our lifestyles are so complex. It's hard to devote a lot of time to what our patients actually need. But again, pharmacists are there to fill that void. One of the components that we do in our pharmacy, and again, many other pharmacies, are something that are called compliance packs, or med planners, or weekly planners. What we do in this particular case is, we collaborate with the physician, we coordinate the physician with the physician to make sure that the medications that the patients have, uh, patients are taking are, are done in a very organized manner. So we will develop these weekly boxes. We will fill them up each week. We hand deliver them to the patient, make sure that the patient's being monitored. If there's any discrepancies, we'll either contact the caregiver or we'll contact the physician to let them know. And again, this is a way of checking to monitoring, see if the patient is actually taking the medications in the proper way. Another thing we do is we try to help the patient with their, with their budgets. Uh, again, Many of our patients are concerned about not only their health and well-being, they're concerned about their financial status. So again, what we do is we provide the patient with a single monthly bill, that's fine, it makes it easier for the caregiver, it's one less thing that the patient has to worry about. These medication planners allow our patients in many cases to stay at home longer. Because again, one of our goals is to keep our patients comfortable. And again, by keeping the patient's medications under control, we can do that in an organized manner. And I do have to tell a story, uh, and I'll try to make it brief, okay. but I do have to tell a story that we had two elderly patients and we were taking care of doing their monthly or weekly medication boxes. Everything was very, very smooth with the patient's history. And unfortunately, the patient's insurance or their mail order company wouldn't allow us to fill their medications any longer just wouldn't allow us to do it. Patients could no longer use our free service, which is again a free service for our patients. It's another issue because this is a service that we do for our patients. But these patients weren't able to utilize the service. They had to take upon the responsibility of taking their own medications. Lo and behold, unfortunately one of the caregivers got seriously sick, had a heart attack. The other individual, the other elderly spouse, ended up in an assisted care facility. Was it directly related to not having their medications? Perhaps not, but it did contribute to it some degree. So again, what we're trying to do is trying to extend the time that our patients can stay in their homes and trying to extend their lifestyles, make things easier. Doctor mentioned that uh, Dr. Hauser and a group of collaborative individuals are working on what we call a smart pill box monitor. And this is a clinical trial that will be starting in the next several months. And this program will take the basic concept of what we're doing with the conventional pill box and doing it in a, in a monitoring manner that will monitor such high tech uh, techniques as um, ocular movements. Because again, there has been studies that show that depending on the severity or the onset of dementia, you can monitor a patient's eye movements and you can get a, a, degree of, a degree of knowledge about their, their patterns in dementia. This particular program is going to be a great program because this is an in-home model. Again, we, we worry about the ethics and we worry about the um, effect on our patients. 
But again, this is a program that is just an extension of a, a program that's already in existence. It's just going to be using some additional monitoring tools to develop a protocol that will be a tremendous benefit and have tremendous impact potentially in the community. As pharmacists, we are part of a team. And I always say that as part of a team, we need to be an integral part of the team. We just can't be there to dispense medications. What we have to be there to do is to collaborate with the physicians, collaborate with the caregivers, to try to make it, again, best for our, our patients. One of the common, or one of the goals is now, is, is something called a patient-centered home or patient-centered home neighborhood. And the whole concept of this is to have the physician or the practitioner as the main caregiver. From that, the services will be branched out. And again, it will include laboratories, it will include physicians, it will include chiropractors, it will include a whole array of services, including assisted care facilities, nursing homes. It is an extension, thank you very much, it is an extension of the f old HMO con um, idea, the old HMO se series, but in a much more advanced, it still gives patients the freedom of choice to go where they want to get the best services they want. And again, pharmacists are important to keep part, keep the whole process moving. We know the patient's medications, we know what they're doing, and we also are in a best logical uh, location to directly have an impact on their health. I think I am one minute short, so I will cut it off there. But again, I want to thank you all. And again, we're here to have an effect or have an impact on the livelihoods of our patients. And again, that's what we're here to work together, again, as a team. Thank you. That will lead to manage with the home health care workers if there are any, with the family members. Again, right now in the conventional system, that is not available. But again, that's one of, there is a, a, another program that's out there which is an electronic device, and that is part of our smart pill design as well, that will actually monitor, and there will be a full monitoring that will contact the physician and the pharmacist to allow that interaction to occur so that if a medication is missed, again, we're not necessarily, again, during, during the pilot program, it will be more of a uh, monitoring tool. But again, the whole design will be obviously, if there is a me medication that's missed, we will know about it and we'll be able to contact the patient directly. I think in the context of dementia, certainly, um, but in, in care of everyone, the bringing together of the human part of the equation, which includes family caregivers and professional caregivers with the technology is what we're going to have to really think about. Any other question? Sir. No, in fact, this is a clinical trial that we're going to be working with Dr. Hauser and the University of Scranton, um, Berkeley, and a couple other institutions throughout the United States. This is a pilot program that we're working all, on. All pharmacies are going to utilize this? Uh, hopefully sometime in the future, yes, sir. Hmm. Yeah, it's just right being now, tested now. Years. Right right now, it's, it's a pilot program with the University of Scranton, yes, sir. Okay. And I think we had one more question back there. Absolutely. As a pharmacy, we need to be a resource, and we have that information available to us. And for any patient, for any caregiver, we always have that information, and it's very accessible to us as well. Okay. One more question. And can everybody please speak up as you ask your questions? And do you have a way to monitor adverse effects? Um, so if, if, if a patient has an adverse effect to a, a medication, does it call you immediately, or how does that? Typically, we get a call just about every week from the patient and or their caregivers giving us some type of update as to what the status of the patient is. We monitor them on a weekly basis, and again, we are looking for any type of interactions. 
Um, again, being the, one of the primary caregivers, we know that if there is a need for uh, patients having a side effect, we're going to be made aware of it through the physician and or the caregiver. Thank you, Eric, very Thank much. Thank you. Okay, good morning. My name is Maggie Boswick, and I'm a social worker at Jewish Family Service. It's an old organization in this community. It exists since 1915. I'm there for the last 19 years. Um, Indeed, we are a non-sectarian um, human service organization, and through counseling, professional counseling, advocacy, and educational programs, we seek to enhance and strengthen the quality of life of individuals, families, and the whole community. We have programs for all ages, and I will just concentrate this morning on the programs that have something to do with the elderly. Um, I will start with our counseling programs, but again, most of our clientele is non-Jewish, that most people don't think so. They think Jewish family serves, oh, you only serve the Jews. We mostly, our, it's not so. Most of our, uh, again, most of our clients are not Jewish. Uh, the counseling with the elderly, uh, we, are li we are all licensed clinical social workers. And whether people come to our office or we go to the homes, which we are absolutely willing to do, for the elderly, we will concentrate on adjustment to aging issues, isolation, depression, anxiety, all things that relate again to aging. We um, had a program, we still have a program that I started about mm, 16 years ago, uh, specific for Holocaust survivors, assistance services. And this was to, it was designed to help the elderly survivors of the Holocaust live their remaining years in safety, in dignity, as independent as possible. As part, this is a very vulnerable aging population uh, due to their unimaginable traumatic past experiences. So support, so support and counseling, and for them to avoid institutionalization and keep them in their homes, we help to reach that end. In order to do that, we realized that we need some sensitivity training to the caregivers. Because of the traumatic events, there were triggers to painful memories that we wouldn't even be aware of, like the smell of cleanliness for them would mean being back in the shower rooms in the concentration camps. Bright lights would for them mean, oh, they can't be after me. So it was important for this population, however we learned from that, that painful memories could be triggered to any population that has had traumatic experiences. So sensitivity training to caregivers is very important. It's part of what we do. Another part of what we do is the case management for the elderly. We try to uh, coordinate the services that people need when they come home, when they are home, when they leave the hospital, if we are called, try to coordinate all the services, whether it is with the physician, whether it is in-home services, whether it is with the area agency of aging, with the family. We do a lot of support to the families of the aging. We uh, started t two new programs. One is the reminiscing program, which is for the wellness of the well-aging elderly who come to senior centers where we do a reminiscing group. We try to tap into good and happy memories. Why always concentrate on the disease and on having problems? Let's try to tap back to the happy memories that we have. And actually, I, when the, I start the group, I start, bring a picture from childhood, a happy picture. Let's discuss this. Where did you live? What did you do? What was your family? Let's try to, and in general, the experience is that people leave after an hour of sharing, connecting with the other people in the group. They all leave with a smile. People are happy. So very simple, but just talking and sharing good memories. So this is, you know, not only concentrating on the disease, on the, let's do something good. 
And then about a year and a half ago, we started a new program, which we call Grow Yourself. We are aiming at the uh, baby boomers, people that are aging slowly but surely. And it's a series of uh, self-improvement and personal growth workshops and seminars who should provide tools and strategies and experiences for living a more empowered and fulfilling life. In order to start something new, learn something new, go out, see what else you can do, meet other people, wellness, prevention, prevent from just staying home and not being active, learn something new, there's no reason why not. So this is a new series we have which has been very positive till now. And this is, you know, we are a member agency of United Way, I just want to mention this as PEC is here for some of the <laughs> programs that we do. <laughs> And uh, we are very happy to have uh, Janet Thousands on our board of directors. So, a so small summary of what we do. Why don't you stay muggy for a minute oh. for any questions? I think the only um, activity from the Grow Yourself uh, program that didn't work was the snowshoeing plan for this winter, right? Yeah, there was no <laughs> snow. <laughs> We postponed it twice, but Karen. <laughs> just a, a simple question: How do you refer a patient to your services? People can refer themselves. The question: How do they know about this? Mm -hmm. we, well, for all of you, we have a website. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are interested, www.jfsoflacoana.org, and we try to, you know, we try to, you know. To it's a very tell people who are here. Group of people when they answer the phone, yeah. which is nice. Again, we exist in 1915. We are kind of non known in the community, but we, we are here for a while already. People can call themselves. You know, that's probably the best. Yeah. Thank you. I'm thinking as we're um, all here together and from so many different places, I should have asked before. When you ask a question, why don't you identify yourself? So, Karen, do you want to tell people who you are and where you're from? Karen Arscott, I'm the director of the physician assistant program at Maryland University. Oh, great. And please, before lunch, Make Here's the microphone, please. Yes, Sam, I'm sorry. <laughs> and, 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 and people in the audience should use the mic as well. Okay, so we'll try, I'll move it around then. Um, but I, uh, I'm just encouraging you all to make sure you meet one or two people that you haven't known before you leave today. <laughs> Any other questions? Good, thanks. Maggie, thank you so much. <laughs> and now Dr. Habubi will speak with us. Good morning to you, and uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to work with you as a representing of the Peniska College of uh, Professional Studies. You know, the Peniska College has nine departments and a clinic, and Andrea Manchon, which is the director of the clinic here, with the great pleasure we try to develop and help the community. The subjects is uh, Community health is a very, very wide subject, as we indicated <laughs> earlier on. We take uh, our cases, you know, from the cradle to the grave, you know, but uh, because this conference about aging, and um, it is very well documented that the number of the people who are, uh, I mean, elderly Americans will soon account to 20% of the population. It means we have 80% have to be able to develop their ability to serve the 20% who are aging. So in the Peniska College, we have the major uh, services or the professional who would be graduated from that department are the physical therapists, occupational therapists, uh, nursing and counseling, who will deliver and will try to build up their uh, uh, advising capability to teach and serve the community to improve on the quality of life as we go along. Uh, I moved to this area in 1989 to fulfill the requirements of state grants was being uh, offered uh, to the community. And while I was in this uh, community, by the time I established myself, I recognized that we have the majority of the populations with fair skin, blue eyes, Irish majority, and I realize there is something which will be specifically related to this community is osteoporosis. So I redirected my 
field and my engineering, I put my engineering hat and I moved into the osteoporosis and worked out to build up better bone and a healthy uh, screening. So I established the very first osteoporosis program in 1990 and uh, we start screening and evaluating with and using my engineering hat at numbers, start looking at uh, that the majority of the populations have some kind of osteoporosis or osteopenia. So this is facts when we try to help to reduce that kind of uh, disease will be is a silent disease. So I worked with the physicians of the community and we start educating them about the management of uh, screening and managing the osteoporosis. And it worked extremely well by building up uh, the intervention and developing the quality of uh, life to reduce the pain, the back pain, and all the consequences coming from the osteoporosis. Uh, the government recognized that osteoporosis is a public health issue, and they approved the screening for osteoporosis in 1995. Four years I was working, we didn't get really that much uh, of uh, uh, benefit because there's no insurance coverage, but the insurance coverage kind of become effective in 1995 and the other uh, health uh, insurance start uh, following the Medicare and start approving the screening for osteoporosis. Um, why it is important, why the government approved it? Because the cost of hip replacement would be with the rehabilitation services would be up to about forty thousand dollars if there is no recall on that hip replacement and there was a recall due to the bad uh, bone uh, the, the implant which is the biocompatibility and the quality of the uh, alloy is being implanted when the person starts suffering with more problems by getting the hip replacement try to take the hip and uh, the recall issue was kind of a new problem. So it looks that there's plenty of room for research and development to prevent a hip fracture or try to build up a better bone. So as we are talking on the osteoporosis, really what we are looking for in the community, a better uh, education, a better uh, uh, diet and exercise, this is the tool how to combat osteoporosis. So as we are going through the osteoporosis, uh, the things what you will see, for example, in uh, this situation, this lazy to say, I was 60 years old, uh, 62 years old, and uh, my doctor said I had bone of 95 years old. So we are looking at somebody who is really aging very, f looks like an old person, but she is only in her 60s. The same thing with this lady, I was uh, absolutely stunning. Uh, brought to, my, to me to find out that uh, I had osteoporosis, so kind of something was not. And this lady in her 52 years old, which she had the bone of 70, 70 years old. And this is more interesting one. If you look at the image of this lady, she is standing, the head well over the shoulder, straight standing up, and showing that it's kind of very normal life. and. If you look at her at age 75, look at the changes, how much it really took place between the first picture and the second picture, and that would be the changes taking place in her life. So I put for you this diagram and just try to show you the situation when you could see the head line go all the way down in a very straight format. But as the person start developing osteoporosis and shrinking gradually and losing height, you could see the changes taking place and the belly start getting gradually being protruded. And uh, so if we want to look at the center of gravity of the head coming down, so the muscles has to be pulled back and keep trying to maintain the patient uh, or that individual balance to be always, always to be able to stand straight or just to maintain their balance without falling forward. What happened with time, we would try to develop the, using the cane just to, as a very simple device to help the individual to be able to stand without uh, falling 
and now we expanded the situation to use the rollator walker where it will be more supporting for the individual to be able to move without falling. So we need more support and more uh, devices to help. People came with more ideas, tried to put uh, a hip uh, pads, you know, when people will be able to wear the hip pads so they will fall, they don't uh, lose their uh, fracture a hip and have all the complications to follow. So looking at the image, this is a kind of more detailed information to show you what is really happening here. And you could see the spinal column, how kind of straight to maintain the individual standing straight. And look at the changes, how much the head was moving forward and well away from the center point for standing. You could see that the spine in this one is very nicely cut off rectangular shapes one after the other. Once the person becomes osteoporotic, you will start realizing there are some compression fracture will be taking place into the lumbar region, into the thorax region. And if you will be able to trace the rib cage, and I called it the Habubi method because I'm the very first person to, uh, thank you, who established uh, this technique. If you go and you uh, evaluate the situation, run your hand right along the rib cage and run your hand along your pelvis. If you could get your four fingers standing straight, and that means you don't have a very clear osteoporosis at this stage, but you could go for the screening to find in detail, but at least you are standing straight. But once the person starts losing the height and getting the compression of fracture, you could see the rib cage sitting right on the pelvis. Mechanically, as an engineer, you can't get that freedom when in this lady, she has a complete freedom around the lumbar region. The lumbar could rotate quite easily right and left, and you'll be able to swing yourself. Once the rib cage sat on the pelvis, you have a very limited movement when you will be able to articulate yourself and move around. The vulnerable areas we'd be looking at would be the uh, femoral neck, the lumbar region, and the wrist. And you could see the difference. This is a normal bone at age 50, and this is the bone when it's time to become osteoporotic. If you look at that small bridge here, because there is no bone or there's no structure, there is the treatment is not going to be beneficial or it could be impacted on this individual because there is no bridge. So if I could show you the difference between these two slides, this one has a compression in it and this one is normal and that would be the gap between the histology of the two items. And Hani did a very good coverage for all this on the biology and the biological change. So the simple thing to do is to go for the screening, evaluate osteoporosis, determine the changes, and this is a very simple device which will take about five minutes to determine if the bone has some osteoporosis. Variety of devices available in the market, but this one is the most important one, a quick fix for what is going on when they will go back and try to, to inject uh, Dillahol in the lumbar spine and jack it up with the air pressure. As you see, the needle will come here, air, air pressure, push it apart, and when that would be established, you will pull the balloon out and you will inject the resin and it will stabilize it. It's a very quick fix, you know, it is, uh, doesn't cost as much as uh, the big surgery to go and put all the implants and the rods to support it, but that's a very quick fix. I know my time is up. I have more stories to tell you, but I'm going to stop at this point and thank you for <laughs> having me. Stay for a minute. So I'm going to entertain a couple questions for, for Ayad as well. And as we were talking, when you think about it, we, we kind of move, we're moving back and forth today from community to high tech, et cetera. The, the level of work and community organization that has to happen and cooperation between patients, families, the insurance system, the health professionals to uh, make sure people get screened for important issues like osteoporosis is enormous. And I think you were talking about how creating this giant uh, net of people to provide support so that we can maximize healthy aging is really important. Uh, comments or questions from the group? Sure. If you would hold because one it, second there oh, for the mic. Maybe I can just speak up. Oh, Don. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, have you found that sedentary lifestyles contribute to this condition? And if in fact they do, to what extent do they? 
Absolutely, it happened to me actually. I have osteoporosis, and the reason for that, since I established this program, and I start reading the DEXA uh, results, sitting continuously, having 2,000 patients a year, and you have to go through the detail of evaluation, I gradually start realizing, start losing my bone. Uh, any other factor could cause me this. I try to keep a very healthy life, but uh, since I start sitting doing nothing, sedentary lifestyle and occupation was the way to, to do it. It's not sedentary by brain, but sedentary with my sitting at the desk and reading the radiology and looking at the data, which will cause me to lose my bone density. Uh, absolutely true, that is the way to look into it. And I encourage, kind of, I have more to say to say that Exercise and diet would be the most important because once we are not moving enough and start sitting down continuously, we are also closing the amount of air we are breathing. I mean, at the present time, I'm glad to see that we have blue bottles in front of us. It has 50, 500 uh, cubic centimeters of, uh, this is the size, we need two of these if we are sitting doing nothing to breathe in and out to maintain it. But if you are sitting into an area for a long time and you are not moving, you are le losing the muscle strength and the chest capacity to be able to expand. And for the lady who her chest kind of getting too close and the belly getting too big, it would reduce the amount of air she would be able to breathe. And that would be another problem which the community will be, impact uh, will be affected. To say this lifestyle, sitting, doing nothing for a long time, it will constrain the breathing and the amount of air we are breathing. So it's kind of, uh, the DOs, they know exactly what they are talking about, try to get you stretch, understanding st straight and building up your strong uh, uh, physique. So always you have that capability. You're making me stand up straight. <laughs> 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 so introduce yourself before you get a knife back. Oh, uh, <clears throat> I don't really know even how to do that. I'm, I'm from the community here, and uh, I'm just interested in community and public <laughs> Thank you. Our bodies uh, replace our entire skeleton, all the cells in our bones, once every eight years. And so what I'm wondering is, do these curvatures or defects happen as a result of changes in maintenance of existing bones, or a defect in the replacement of our skeleton over time? Uh, the word for that is modeling and remodeling. I mean, if we don't have this phenomena of modeling and remodeling, there are two kinds of cells who are working their way through the body. One called osteoclast, one called osteoblast. The class will be eating into the bone. The blast will be able to build it. Once one work stronger than the other, so either you have negative or positive accumulations of bone. Why they are working together? If we have a baby and the baby is not having this remodeling process will take a place continuously, the baby will never grow. So to do that, the Lord blessed us to have these two cells to work all the time to do the modeling and remodeling to be able to build up uh, the cells and cell replacements. But once the osteoclast start affecting the integrity of the bone, and there is not bridges enough to build on it. So when the people, came, when Merck came initially with the Fosamax, which is the bisphosphonate component, it's uh, very easy to start to kill the osteoblast, uh, osteoclast and allow the osteoblast to build on them. So you always have the platform try to build it up and try to create this new, new modeling. But once you have over modeling, that's a problem. If somebody, for example, been injured and uh, due to lack of exercise or the people go to the outer space, if they are unable to exercise and have weight bearing exercise, they will start losing their calcium. And you will see that calcium depletion will be due to the osteoclastic activity, try to dissolve the bone and get it out of the body. Sorry, Dr. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna take one more question now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Ken Quinn, I'm a social worker. Very apparent in your uh, slight presentation that there was not a male in there. All females. Can you comment or expand on that and where do the males fit in? My apologies, I should have, I mean, if I have more time, I will, I will tell you more about it. It's one in five. Every four, uh, one in five. I mean, if you take the populations, one male to every uh, in five, I mean, one to four, uh, four women, one man, and that would be the ratio of the men having osteoporosis. The reason for the men having osteoporosis is due to either uh, 
secondary to uh, hormonal diseases or any other factors. But for me, when I was looking into it in the past, is disuse osteoporosis. And that disuse osteoporosis is mainly focused for the people who become injured, spinal cord injury or head injury. Immediately, the <coughs> paralyzed section starts getting all the calcium to dissolve and go back to the kidney. And the good intervention from the physicians and all the physicians involved in the management of, of the spinal cord injury to evaluate the kidney to be sure it would be able to manage the dissolved calcium because that would be the very first things to go. Go to the kidney and the kidney, wow, how much calcium I can handle that amount of quantity and you could get a kidney stone to follow. So these are the balance and the equation and when you find a nutritionist would be a good uh, person to be able to intervene with the, in the process. Dr. Ames, hello. Oh, Dr. Ames, we don't want to let you out of the questioning. I'd just like to reinforce the idea that nutrition is really important and you can help yourself in preventing disease. So you don't get your vitamin K, you're disabling osteocalcin, and then your bones form strong. You don't get your calcium and magnesium, you're in trouble. You don't get your vitamin D, lots of us are vitamin D deficient in Northern Ireland. And so that's something you can do yourself to prevent osteoporosis. Another risk factor in Northeast PA is the sometimes lack of sunshine <laughs> that we experience as yes. the winter bear, you know, wears on. I'd like to invite Peg Kopko to come up. And I, as I've described Peg, she's kind of our uh, cleanup hitter. I asked her to respond a bit to some of the themes that may come up from the three presenters and also give us that big picture view that, that the United Way has of our services in our community and needs. Hi, thanks so much for having me. And it's really nice to be in front of a group and I'm not asking for money. Because typically, <laughs> <laughs> and I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so I'll be as brief, hopefully, as, you know, as I um, possibly can be. Um, the United Way, the, there's been a, a theme here at this health group, um, health panel, with the cradle to grave. And we, in United Way world, also think we fund those services from cradle to grave. But I will tell you just a little bit briefly, um, we fund a variety of programs in the community. We spend, I'd say, a little bit over a half a million dollars on aging programs in our community, funding things like the Older Adult Program at Jewish Family Services, Telespon, the Senior Companion Program. We fund serving seniors. We also do things such as at the Y fund, fund programs that help with healthy aging. So that's a little bit of broad over thing. What we don't also con um, collect as our aging dollars are those um, seniors who are using programs such as our emergency assistance programs. Because in our community, we have an 18% senior citizen population. We have a, a high poverty rate. And seniors are taking advantage of food banks, emergency rent programs. Um, they are the single biggest user of the LIHE program, which is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program run through the state. And we also, through our gift of warmth, then give additional dollars. So those th things sometimes you don't think about when you're thinking about who's using those kinds of services. Because the seniors in our community want to stay in their home. There's just no doubt about it. Most of them want to stay in their home. And those are things like LIHEAP is an important piece for them to be able to stay um, within their home. So those are some of the things United Way does. But I'm supposed to kind of give you an overview of some of the things that we still see as a need. We like to think of ourselves as conveners and problem solvers. So we just don't fund. We like to bring different sectors of the community in together and say, how do we address an issue? And what are some of the concerns we have? So I can tell you some, some of the things that we really need to look at for our senior population. None of us like to think we're closing in then that gap of seniors, including myself. Um, I've just sat through all of our agencies that have come in and reviewed 66 programs and when they talk about, you know, those people over 50, I kind of got a little scared. Because uh, you don't want to think you're there, right? But you really are. Um, we have to really look at creative ways across different sect sectors at trying to address some of these needs. Like when they talk about the prescription program and you're talking about a patient um, centered home neighborhood. I think we're going to have to be right out in those neighborhoods to do that for some of those. While we have lots of senior centers and we have lots of senior centers who are always attempting to engage those seniors, there are many people in our neighborhoods who don't engage. And that's a concern because what are you doing with them? Um, unfortunately, that's the, our senior population is going to be growing and our resources I don't see as growing. 
Um, so I think, again, looking at creative ways to do this. Funding will always be an issue. So I did call some of our aging providers and ask what some of the concerns were. They told me transportation is an increasing need, not just for medical appointments, but to get to the grocery store. I mean, you may be on a bus route, but maybe, you know, maybe the bus route is two blocks and you can't carry the groceries there. That's an issue. Um, there's also stress on our caregivers. And you have to think about this. And we know that there's stress on our caregivers, but think of that as employers. Some of your employees are having stress because mom or dad just got diagnosed or mom and dad just went to the emergency room or mom or dad just had to get placed. Where do you go? How do you get that information? And it really only becomes important to you when it happens to you. So there's a lot of stress out there that you really don't know that are happening, I think, with your employee groups. Um, there were also, I was also told to in, um, emphasize the number of out-of-town adult children who are calling in for assistance. How do they take care of mom or dad? And what are some of those needs and, and how can they bridge those gaps and not have to call 42 agencies to get any answer? Um, which is kind of, I thought was a good one. Um, we have to look for new partners. One of the things that United Way has partnered with with the University of Scranton is their low income um, tax assistance program, the VITA program. And so the University of Scranton does a great job of doing it here in Brennan Hall. And United Way then has taken it out and put it out in the neighborhoods. A lot of who take advantage of that are our seniors. And I will tell you, I was up in the Mid Valley um, Library one Friday afternoon, and even me, who's been around for a long time, was very concerned with the level of who was walking in the door. And they're living in the neighborhoods alone. I mean, there were more oxygen bottles, walkers, and they're coming in to get their taxes done. And some neighbors are driving them. And it's a little concerning. And when you look at, because now you have their taxes in front of them, some of them have no clue what's happening with their financial needs. That, I thought, was um, scary. The other thing we found in a couple parts of the community is the number of our seniors with gambling problems. You don't think of that, but when you're, when you're doing their taxes and you're looking at it, you see that. So that's something I think maybe we're going to try and see if we can get some information out at the senior centers about identifying those kinds of things, because that, that is um, some concern. So I think that's about it in a nutshell, some of the concerns, and I'm trying to make sure we're on time. Anybody have any questions for me? Good. I'm going to invite people to, Peg, why don't you take a seat? That sounds and good to me. We had intended, and, and we actually are getting close to our time, although we did start late, so we're going to take probably up to five to ten minutes to have some discussion. I, I think the... Um, you know, everybody's talking about the anniversary of the Titanic sinking, and um, when you think about Peg's comments and all these others, in so many ways we're just noticing in, uh, from our different perspectives the tip of the iceberg of what's coming. The aging of the population, <coughs> our era of constrained resources, the needs for coordination and collaboration among us, and the many diverse needs. I think you did a tremendous job, and thank you for, for seeking input from your, your colleagues and different agencies. Uh, the, the number of diverse, diverse needs that we really need to try to address as best we can um, to give support to our elders and to their families, are, are, it's almost overwhelming. But we shouldn't be overwhelmed because we're very resourceful people. So I would like to invite for the next five or ten minutes some input from all of you about where you see some of the opportunities for collaboration um, and, and, co and, and uh, coordination among us. How can we leverage the resources we have and do expect to have? Do you have some good examples of some things that are going on? Let's start with Karen. Okay. Um, Karen Arscott, and as a... Uh, you just keep it fairly close okay. to okay. enough, I was um, I am the director of the PA program in Marywood, but I'm also on the board for Meals on Wheels of Lackawanna County. And I think that this is a great time for me to just point out that in Lackawanna County, Meals on Wheels delivers about 800 meals a day, and we have a wait list because we don't have funding to, to deliver any more meals. And this is important because our, um, our elderly and uh, those who are receiving meals oftentimes are sharing their meals with their grandchildren. They're sharing their meals with their dogs and their cats. And sometimes that meal that we deliver is the only meal they have in a day. We have a tremendous need in our area for food uh, for, for the senior citizens of this area. And I think it's, it's, not, it's not really talked about that much. I'm sure that 
most of you here are surprised to hear 800 meals a day um, in Lackawanna County alone. Really, it's just a, it's just an amazing thing. Um, funding's being cut, and um, and we have a wait list. And so, you know, we I don't know. Maybe this is a place where we can all put our heads together and come up with some ideas on how we can get food to uh, to the people who are hungry right in our county in Lackawanna County. So. Thank you. My name is Ken Quigley. I'm a social worker, as I mentioned before. I don't have to have a phrase this question. Not only food, but housing. Uh, I'm a volunteer for Habitat for Humanity in this community. And as you may have seen in the past couple of weeks, we dedicated our first home in probably seven years. It took us about two and a half years to build this home. I've only been involved with it for about a year and a half. But my comment is that it's not meant to be critical at all. This is wonderful. I'm so glad I came. Uh, I found out about this conference by a little article in the paper about that day. And I'm wondering if this is such, and it is such a critical component of our community, especially Lackawanna County being one of the foremost counties of population of the aging in the country, why there isn't more publicity about this conference, and are there any consumers here? <coughs> Thank you. Good point. I mean, I think. Well, I think I, I think I'd like to follow up on that. I don't even. I don't think I need the microphone. Well, just uh, for because we're recording. Oh, okay. Uh, I have the same concern. I, I found out about this conference with a little a little newspaper ad, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I think this question might be best left. Uh, for the end of the day in, in the general discussion. But the major concern that I have is institutional engagement of people that we're calling seniors. I, I found myself in this group, and now what I'm finding out is that if you, if you really want to know about seniors, you really have to find a way as institutions to engage them. And it is a very, very difficult problem, even for seniors who want to be involved, to break through what I, what I essentially am finding myself, which is that institutions tend to study seniors, but they don't engage them. When we're, when we're employed, when we're employed, we have a connection within a community. But we're finding out now that more and more people are retiring at age 62. And these are people that are educated and experienced and bring a great deal of, of I think, energy if they were engaged and creativity to the things that we're talking about. But I think that, and I, and I do mean this to be critical, I think that our institutions of education, including our healthcare institutions and so forth, really need to take a very hard look at whether they want to engage seniors. I'll give you two examples. <clears throat> I saw two articles, I saw two articles in the newspaper. One of them had to do with generally the level of health in Lackawanna County and finding out that the general level of health is not something that we can, that we can be proud of. Uh, and the other was a study that was done by several national groups having to do with the amount of healthcare services that we're receiving. And that includes a lot of us seniors as to whether these healthcare services that, that we receive are in fact beneficial. Okay, so if I as a senior have an interest in those and want to be actively involved, where do I go? And I find out that I don't have the answer and I don't see institutions within the community coming and saying, we want the active involvement of our seniors in addressing these particularly critical issues that in fact do affect us because they affect our, our health care uh, and they affect our medical care, our, our, our Medicare and all of these kinds of things. So, I'm hoping at the end of the day that we can take a look at this thing called institutional engagement to find out whether the institutions really do want to engage seniors. I'm going to get Dan's comment, but if I could just respond to him. And I want to thank Ken and Don for bringing up this issue, and let's make a commitment to come back to it at the end of the day. Hopefully this conference could be the start of some inter-institutional, within our community, engagement with each other um, in the kind of ways you're talking about. As you talk, I've already thought of a, 
a lot of ideas. And, and, and we know in our healthcare and our educational institutions, we can get caught up, as you well know from your interactions with us, in the in the day-to-day -day work um, and not look outward the way we should. And instead of doing for seniors, always doing with seniors is probably what we need to be aiming for. Uh, I'm going to take Dan and then here on the two. Mm -hmm. Sure. <coughs> One aspect of these problems that we're not discussing today is economic development. When you look at the American Community Survey census data for Lackawanna County, what you find is that we live as long as everyone else in the rest of the country. The reason our average age is older than the rest of America, and the reason we have a greater percentage of people over 65, is because we have a brain drain of people aged 25 to 44 leaving the region. So, Lackawanna County in northeastern PA is a region in need of diversification of its economy. It's over-reliant on things such as manufacturing, retail, and service. And I just wonder if we shouldn't be thinking a little bit about how do we engage companies in economic development that might employ the 25 to 44-year-old in an industry that addresses the needs of an aging population. So, I'm going to take one or two more questions and then ask our panelists if they have a last uh, comment. Okay. Uh, my name is Marie Bonavoy. I'm from Mary Rose PA program and I'm also a clinically practicing physician assistant. I just wanted to address Eric. Um, I practice in Dixon City. Oh, I don't know why those towns are so close up there. I don't know where they are. But um, I just wanted to tell you that it's a great comfort to be able to call the local pharmacist. And I know this is a silly thing, but I had a patient. She was on a terracotta aspirin, like everybody is. And she didn't think her pharmacy carried it, and she was driving 10 miles for it or something like that. And all I did was call her pharmacy, I think it might have been Medicap, and they just put, they pulled her file and said, next time Mary comes in, give her this aspirin. I know it's a silly, small thing, but she didn't, she was afraid to drive those 10 miles. And we're actually thinking about taking her license away, so we're trying to keep her off the street. So that was a great comfort to us. Those, those little pharmacists. And they're not, they're, those are not, those are, those are enormous things. In fact, the other reminiscence I was making about pharmacy was, was the several community pharmacies in the Bronx where I practice were just invaluable. Um, I'd rather be on staff than my partners in here. A last comment or question from the group? I think people are ready for lunch. Well, I, um, I, I am gonna, we're just going to ask if, because we want to see. No, 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 that's fine. I just want to, before we break up, I'll just I just want to thank everyone for coming, and I agree that we do need to get the, the seniors in, involved more in our, in our information. Again, they are the recipients of, our, of what we have to offer. So, again, the next meeting, we're going to have a lot more seniors present. So, thank you. I just want to thank everybody for coming here and for inviting me to be here. Please build a better bond. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I will bite the bullet and say if United Way believes that they're a convener of groups, that yes, we would help convene whatever we, whatever the group seems to think we need to do regarding senior services or whatever, how that we, we would engage. I mean, I, I assume it's not just going to be one group, so we'd be happy to be a partner with that. Thanks. Oh, so I, I have uh, three things to accomplish in this, at this point in the um, discussion. One is um, to thank a number of people because we're now uh, at the lunchtime crowd, as they say. The second is to talk about uh, conference year one, conference year two and to your point, conference year three. And then after the lunch, we all get our plates and our, I'm going to have the pleasure of introducing Senator John Blake to the podium. So first, let me start with a few thank yous. We have, we all owe a great, great debt of gratitude to Dr. Tabby Miller Scandal. Without her efforts and without her insight and without her creative thinking and ideas, this would not be happening because I know myself and I know how I work and if it was all up to me, it would never have happened. So, Tabby, thank you very much. Another person that I'd like to thank is Jamie Hayes. Jamie acted as the conference coordinator 
both Tabby and I know that no matter what we did, if it wasn't coordinated, it also wasn't going to happen. Jamie, thank you very, very much. I'd also like to thank Blue Cross of Northern Pennsylvania for being an actual tangible sponsor. And if anybody's here from Blue Cross, I'd like you to take a message back. Thank you very much. We'll see you next year. Bring a bigger check. <laughs> and to that end, I want to thank Meg Hambros from the university's development office for reaching out to Blue Cross and for bringing in a corporate side to the conference. Uh, every machine requires energy. This machine requires cash energy. So with that being said, um, I now want to shift into uh, the comparison of the two years and let's see what the difference was. Forget about the weather. Today's a gorgeous day compared to April 8th, 2011, which was a, a tornado at least. And I'd really like to start by sort of telling you all a story. Uh, so this guy is walking across the street and he gets hit by a truck and he's in a coma in the hospital and he finds himself standing in front of the devil in hell and he says oh my god did I die have I gone to hell and the devil says no no you're not dead but you will be and when you do this is where you'll wind up but we wanted to show you the place so he takes this guy to a gorgeous oak covered, you know, golden covered door. He opens it up and inside there's a party going on. There are people dancing, there's a bar, there's a buffet, it's air conditioned, it's wonderful. He turns to the devil and he says, I don't understand, all my life I've been told that hell is, you know, uh, damnation and suffering and pain and, and misery and here it's a party. People are dancing. There's a wonderful buffet. It's air-conditioned, plush carpeting. What's going on? And the devil says, look, we get a bad reputation. He goes back to his body, and sure enough, two weeks later, he dies. Doesn't even wait to get judged. Goes right into the room, bursts the doors open, and there, there are men chained to the wall, being whipped, tortured by other devils, being scarified, branded. It's horror. It's brimstone in the air. And he turns to the devil and he says, I don't understand. Two weeks ago, I was here and there was, you know, a buffet, an open bar, dancing, air conditioning, plush carpeting, comfortable sofas. What's, and now it's, it's pain, suffering, you know, damnation. And the devil shrugs his shoulders and says, look, there's a big difference between tourism and immigration. <laughs> so last year, last year we were tourists. <laughs> The first year of this conference was all of us putting our toe in the water to see if it's swimmable. Last year at this time, we had sent out one grant for a half million dollars written by four faculty members at the University of Scranton. Last year, we were beginning to reach out and sort of make friends and make colleague contacts all over Northeast Pennsylvania. What happened? in the intervening year. This year, based on conference time, we're closing our funding request period with four applications, totaling $2.9 million. We went from four faculty members to 10. We have now a collaborative group of 10 faculty members who are engaged in various aspects of aging. We went from four undergraduate students who were involved in an interdisciplinary research program on elderly research studies to 26. We had no community collaboration whatsoever at the end of year one, meaning April 8th, 2011, and today we have co collaborations with Marywood University, with the Jewish Community Center of Greater Scranton, Moses Taylor Hospital, and with uh, Northeast Eye Institute. We've gone from no collaboration now to a growing degree. And I'm not saying that one or two people, are, we're, we're collaborating broadly. We've also gone from not having any contact with any other institution, and in one year, 
we now have colleagues and collaborators at the following institutions. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, the Johnson Space Center in uh, Texas. Now it turns out, why would you do aging work and include two space agencies? I mean, these are the real rocket scientists. And the answer is, well, they spent like hundreds of billion dollars developing all of this advanced technology to go to the moon, to go up in space, and there's no human application for it. Who cares what the air smells like in a space station? It doesn't influence my behavior, but they are very, very interested and very happy to collaborate on projects that bring uh, translational technology into the mainstream. We're collaborating with the University of California at San Diego, two of the nation's most famous uh, divisions there. One is the uh, BioCircuits Institute, and the other one is the Center for Supercomputing. It's one of four centers in the United States. And we've now also reached out internationally. We're collaborating with the Fraunhofer Institute in uh, Germany. It's one of the preeminent research facilities, and uh, that project involves an advance in eye tracking. It seems that the Fraunhofer Institute developed a eye tracking system that fits into the rear view mirror of a Mercedes Benz and as you're falling asleep it detects that through eye movement and wakes you up. We immediately saw value for that in studies of delirium and dementia. So there are collaborators now. Now this is the, the uh, State of the Union as of April 12, 2012. In a year from now what we'd like to do is we'd like to expand our collaboration. It's not just the University of Scranton, it's all of us. Because as we go, the nation will follow. Regardless of what the reason is why we seem to be older, the fact is we are. So one of the goals for the next year is to increase our level of grant requests, to increase the number of studies that we do collaboratively with agencies, with other laboratories, with other universities and to reach out internationally and try to get the best of the best and also maybe to begin going for a swim now in that pool that last year we just stuck our toe into. And going for a swim means putting together a concept for a Northeast Pennsylvania Center for Aging. And in that concept have a place for people who are interested in research, meaning collaboration, have a place for people who are looking for <coughs> services and don't know where to go, have a place for resource information, what's new, but have a central location. At the end of the day, we're all here because we believe that this is the place, meaning Scranton, University of Scranton, Commonwealth Medical College, this is the place that the flag needs to be planted, and from that flag we need to put together something that will model. I don't think other aging institutes in the country have the really, you know, science fiction research that we do. I mean, we're really at the cutting edge or at the humanistic level of having a pharmacy that loads pill containers once a week and delivers them to, to the elderly and understanding that, the implications of that. So this is where the end of what I wanted to report to all of you. And I hope that next year when I stand, well, we won't be here next year because I think we're going to need bigger quarters. But um, I hope to talk more about how we continue to grow and expand. With that being said, I have to tell you, I'm really shocked that I'm shutting up at 11.30. It's lunchtime now. Outside is the buffet. Please gather your you know, lunch plates. Come right back in, and then we'll begin the midday program in about 10 minutes. There's two sides to the buffet, so it should actually move a little bit more efficiently than one side. 